Hello, everybody. I'm sorry, I, it took me a while to enter the room. I think we have so many participants that the system needs a little more time today. And therefore, let's give it one more minute and then we'll start. Okay, because we don't want to waste too much time uh, of our discussion later on, I think we will start. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to the fifth edition of the Delta Talks. Um, just to remind everybody, this is uh, a webinar series uh, initiated um, with uh, the Wageningen University and Research and the Asian Mega Deltas Initiative. Um, we started small with only uh, the, the, the inner teams and the smaller teams, and we have now started to expand our invitations a little bit because we thought uh, the webinars have been so interesting and successful that we wanted to uh, yeah, reach a larger audience. So thanks, everybody, um, for joining. Um, and maybe, so I don't see Katarin, who usually uh, is uh, my co-host, but I see Marianne. Do you want to say a few words? Yes, uh, welcome everybody. Katarin is sending her greetings. Uh, she cannot attend uh, today, mm -hmm. so I will replace her and I'm very curious uh, yeah, to, to see and hear the, the presentations from today. Looking forward. I hope that the people really managed to enter. I also thought what is happening and I I also forwarded now to even a few other people who couldn't even not find the link. So it's really a, a big audience and uh, that is looking forward. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so yeah, today we have uh, two presentations actually. It's, it's about behavioral research. Um, one uh, focusing on conflict uh, of the uh, yeah adaptation uh, options, and uh, one about migration as uh, an adaptation climate change adaptation option. We will before we start, we will uh, add a registration link uh, for invites to this webinar to the next um, newsletter that we will be sending out shortly. Uh, so <coughs> you don't always invite all uh, participants that we may know so that some people who are interested can register and they will receive invites uh, to not uh, crowd everybody's inbox more than necessary. But without further ado now, uh, let's uh, start, and I'm not sure who starts. Uh, I see Zung has her camera up, so I assume it's her. Yeah. And I, 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 I suggest we have both presentations that are about 10 to 15 minutes back to back, and then we move into discussion later on. So please note down all your comments and questions. Zung, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen first. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, 
I'm, my name is uh, Phương Dung Lê. I'm from uh, I'm a PhD researcher at the Wageningen University and Research, and also the Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAD. Um, thank you for having me today. And today I will present our research about uh, conflict and co cooperation in high climate risk transitional agricultural zones in Vietnam. And this work is uh, ha has been done together with uh, Professor Francisco Alpiza uh, from Wageningen University and Research, and uh, also Dr. Catherine Nelson from Erie. So let me start uh, with some motivation for this work. Uh, so the 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 research has been like um, mo motivated by the theme of like climate security. Uh, so it had been uh, discussing that climate change have um, in great so have security implication and uh, is had can lead to um, conflict. Um, and and also climate adaptation strategies are expected to reduce this uh, climate change impact and improve improve human security. But sometimes it might not be the case. And uh, some research point out the risk of, uh, of man adaptation, where like like poorly desired adaptation strategies can lead to uh, more vulnerable to climate change impacts. And um, sometimes it also can create uh, further conflicts between different actors. So um, that's why kind of in this research, we want to look at the, the um, some relationship between climate adaptation and conflicts um, and cooperation also. And um, we look at the conflict uh, and we want to use the behavioral uh, experiment to, <clears throat> to look at the conflict and cooperation. And the uh, literature on experiment research has suggested like factor of like, conflict like uh, inequality, aversion, or fear, or competition for resources. Um, so we look at the the we we are interested in the Mekong Delta of Vietnam, where uh, it's like very important food production region uh, of Vietnam and Southeast Asia, and it's also one of the most vulnerable areas to climate change impacts. Um, so different climate adaptation strategies have been implemented in the region, like such as uh, alternative land use uh, or alternative labor use. Then the, here in this research, we are particularly interested in the transition between rye and streams in uh, like rye and stream area of, of the Mekong Delta. And um, this kind of like land use transition usually happening at, at community, community level and decisions um, should be made in on majority. So sometimes conflict may emerge as part of this transition, like due to a decision making power or opportunity cost. Like for example, uh, farmers, like rice farmer want to move to rice stream, but then like may, majority of, of his neighbors does do not want to move to rice stream and um he's usually cannot do that because uh, uh the majority do not want to do that and he might not be happy and maybe there's some tension and conflicts uh, between neighborhoods so in this research we want to explore um the role of decision making power and and op opportunity cost uh on uh affecting the the conflict and behavior uh, and co cooperation behavior of farmer so we ask how do farmer lacks of decision making power affect their conflict and cooperation behaviors and how do farmer opportunity cost also affect these behaviors so we did de develop the conceptual framework from the uh, pro and smith uh, like utility function, basically telling that inequality neg ne negatively affect utility. And and we add like first step is at the agency, which is the decision making power. Uh, and we argue that uh, decision making of power can play a role uh, affecting utility and behavior. And the next step, we also add the um, uh, opportunity cost, because we also believe that uh, opportunity cost opportunity cost can be an important factor too. So our hypothesis is that farmer without agency, meaning like lack of decision making power, are more likely to behave spitefully and less likely to cooperate. 
and a farmer without agency facing high and facing higher opportunity costs are also more likely to behave spitefully and less likely to cooperate. So to test this hypothesis, we use the um, behavioral experiment in two provinces, um, Bạc Liêu and Kiên Giang of Vietnam. And uh, the, the, we conducted a series of big behavioral games, uh, it's, uh, including like investment game, joy of destruction game, and public good game. Uh, we, uh, so the, the, part, the first one is the public, uh, the, the investment game where farmer was randomly assigned to four types of farmer, very good at stream, good at stream, very good at rice, good at rice. And note that the very good type are facing higher uh, opportunity cost in this game. Farmer can make the investment decision on whether to invest in rye or stream and whether to invest highly, uh, highly or moderately. So the the after the first game, we uh, also in the first game we we, we match, randomly match farmer to each other, um, and then they will play in pair for the 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 the, the, the rest of the the experimental session. Uh, we after the first game, we will randomly select the one who make the decision. So kind of like create a random uh, selection of have farmer having no agency or having agency, and then they enter the second game. The second game can be joy of destruction game or public good game. So the order is uh, is uh, is uh, interchangeable between these two games to 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 control for order effect, and then. Um, in the joint destruction game, farmer will have the chance to to deduct partner money, um, but they also have to pay a bit of, um, pay for that action. Uh, in the public good game, farmer have the ch farmer has a chance to contribute to the uh, public good where it can benefit to the community and to them. Um, so that's the idea of the game. We also implemented a questionnaire survey, uh, and and uh, in total we have 360 households, uh, like were randomly selected through a uh, multi state uh, sampling methods, and then uh, we have uh, in for for each game session we have 12 farmers, so in total we have 30 game sessions in 30 village. Okay, so now it's come to the result. Uh, first is the joy of destruction game. We, um, okay, before uh, presenting the result, I would like to say that we did register our re design and hypothesis be before um, implementing the data collection uh, through like submitting our pre-analysis pre pre plan to EGAP. And uh, the result of the joy of destruction game, uh, as you can see on the graph, um, the the blue bar is the farmer without agency, and the orange bar is farmer with agency. And you can see across of the group, um, especially in the food sample and the uh, very good group, uh, farmer without agency are more likely to deduct other income. And then the level of absolute deduction is also significantly higher for farmer without agency. But for the good group, yeah, as you can see, the, the difference are not significant. Um, and then the effect, the different uh, effect com is seem coming from the very good farmer group who have higher opportunity costs that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, and then then this kind of like confirming that, okay, farmer with, age, on average, farmer with uh, agency, without agency are more likely to, to behave uh, spitefully. The effect coming stronger to, from the one who uh, have higher opportunity cost. So we also run regression uh, to check this result. So we use the uh, logist estimator um, on the to check the effects on the destructive behavior, and then um, we use the uh, OLS the estimator to check the uh, the effect on absolute level of reduction. And in the yeah, as you can see. The food at the food sample effect of having no agency is uh, significant. Um, 
significant also in but then in the good farmer group uh, it lose the significant and the, the 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 effect is stronger uh, like strongest in the group of the very good farmers so basically this is result saying that um lack of agency could lead to the increase about um eight, 19 to 26 percentage points uh, of deductive behavior in among very good farmers yeah so result for the public uh, good contribution um interesting but not very significant like so we 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 were checking result and we believe that it is because uh, the group of um uh, but because the contribution level is very high across all of the group it's like more than 80 percent uh always like more than 80 percent of farmer contributing the to the public good um and so that way it's more difficult to detect the dif the, the significant difference between groups um regarding the absolute level of uh, contribution we also see that uh, there's a significant uh, difference between the one who who without agency and the one with agency so um without agency farmers uh, are more like uh, are contributing less than the the farmer with agency the regression result also saying similar stories but then um the so there's no um, significant effects uh, in terms of like whether farmer uh, farmer contribute to public good or not, but uh, in terms of like uh, effect on the absolute contribution, we see uh, having no agency ha have significant effect only in the model um, without control variable. In the model with control variable. Um, you can see that it lose the the significant gains, uh, and this is kind of like saying uh, another story. Like other other control variable have stronger effect, and it and then the the um, the uh, no agency variable is, is no longer significant. Conclusion: So our results suggest that farmer without decision making power are more likely to exhibit spiteful behaviors. And then this is kind of an like indicator of conflict. Um, the effect is stronger and more significant among farmers with higher opportunity costs, like which is the very good farmer group, and uh, because they pay higher, larger trade off in the first game. And uh, the effect of having no agency, no agency is not significant for cooperation behaviors, uh, mainly because of high cooperation in own groups. Um, some implication of this research, uh, we see that uh, the results suggest that land use planning for climate adaptation need to involve uh, empowering empowering farmers to make informed decisions about their land use practices, and also uh, policymakers should aim for more equitable resource allocation in adaptation policy to minimize the perceived opportunity cost, like maybe through. Um, uh, ensuring fair access to resource uh, like land water to own uh, the own affected people and then also reduce to to reduce the uh, resort conflict of conflicts over resource scarcity so we see that in general life in the field experiment is um useful and then uh, to, to understand farmer behaviors and uh, it's also uh, kind of like create a um, very uh, fun experience for farmers they really enjoy the the work uh, the, the 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 game session and uh, we also think it's uh, have like potential benefit to explore further in future research thank you very much uh, for your attention and i look forward to your comment and suggestion thank you very much zung i would love to go straight into questions and discussion but we have a second uh, study to present. So let's move to the second one first. And everybody, please note down all the questions you have. Um, and that is being presented by Katie, I believe. Go ahead, Katie. Yes, thank you very much. Let me share my screen.
Okay. Can you see it in presentation mode? Nope. We see it in the normal slide preparation mode. Yeah. No? no? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Katie Nelson, and um, I have been involved in, in both of the researches, the one that Zung just presented and also this one that I will present. Um, as an advisor to PhD students. So um, Sousa uh, from Wageningen uh, worked on this research and also Kung, who is um, uh, an employee of Erie in Vietnam. Uh, I am also located in the Hanoi Vietnam office for uh, the International Rice Research Institute. And today I will be providing um, some evidence that we have from choice experiments on uh, climate change and migration decisions. Um, so just to start off, this work uh, is taking place in Bangladesh and Bangladesh is a low lying uh, Delta nation that has high vulnerability to climate change and climate induced disasters. Um, the specific area where we are doing research is in Hatia Island, which I'm not sure if you can see where my um, my mouse is moving here, but it's at the very south part of uh, the mouth of the Meghna River and the, the Ganges River, and it's in the Bay of Bengal. This area is primarily um, agriculture and fishing in terms of, of livelihoods for the residents there. And the island does face um, frequent and severe uh, rapid onset climate change, which is characterized by erosion, cyclones, and flooding. And it also experiences slow onset change from increasing saline intrusion, tidal inundation from sea level rise, and increasing temperatures. Mm. That's it. Um, so what the reason some of the reasons why we uh, undertook this research and in this particular location is um, that there's relatively uh, a lot of anecdotal evidence saying that under conditions of extreme climate change, um, migration is one of the possible adaptation strategies that people will take. Um, however, uh, there is relatively little evidence to support this uh, causal uh, relationship. And so that's something that we wanted to actually undertake is um, a, a methodology that can show that there's, there is some causal relationship between the two and also um, what the effects are. Uh, so migration, it's a very complex choice um, that can be influenced by social, economic, cultural, and ecological conditions of uh, both where an individual resides and also where they're considering migrating to. Um, it, because this is a complex choice that has multiple different um, conditions and attributes uh, uh, attributed to those choices, um, it's difficult to disentangle the individual effects that each one of these may have on the migration decision. Um, and just asking people um, straight up, you know, if you experience um, a, a, a climate disaster, are you likely to migrate? Um, can, you know, also kind of overshadow the fact that there may be economic drivers that are influencing that more so than the climate change. And there can also be subconscious drivers, which people may not even realize. And so therefore it it can be difficult for them to recall or put specific weight um, on the different attributes. Um, so the aim of the study is to um, investigate the, the strength of each of those different types of drivers um, and what their relationship is between climatic events and migration decisions. Now, um, we chose a methodology that is called choice experiments or discrete choice experiments. And these are a form of choice modeling where participants are presented with a number of different alternatives and asked to choose their most preferred option based on the, the alternatives that they're presented with. Um, and if you see in the picture on the right there, that's just an example um, of, of how this might be used. Uh, it's, it's often used in consumer market research um, to understand what are the traits of a particular product that influence um, purchasing decisions of consumers, 
but this has also been extended into non-market evaluation of environmental goods and services. Um, and so that's why we chose to use this particular approach is because um, it, it's difficult to put a value, for example, on some environmental attributes or also some choices such as migration or moving um, to a different location. And um, so we thought this would be an interesting approach to, to try and use in this type of a setting. Um, this, based on our literature review, this is the first time that um, in, in published research at least, that this approach has been used to elicit preferences around migration choices and migration decisions. Um, so uh, th this, this type of theory is um, using the random utility theory, which describes that the choices um, that people will make is what utilize, it, it maximizes their utility of the particular uh, decision. Uh, and so to move into more of the sampling strategy, um, so we used a stratified, stratified random sampling approach um, to ensure that there was inclusion of different types of subgroups where there's multiple age ranges. Um, specifically, we also wanted to focus on gender and ensure that we included um, you know, a, a large number of women in the sample. Um, particularly because in, in Bangladesh, oftentimes women may not have the decision-making power. So we also wanted to understand from their perspective um, about how migration decisions are made in their point of view. Um, also including occupation and different economic classes. Um, we sampled from 14 different villages uh, across six different unions. Um, there you know, is relative uh, homo homogeneity across the the different unions. So we don't expect that there would be differences between where people are from in terms of um, the union or the village, but more so that there may be differences across classes, um, income, age group, gender. And altogether, we sampled 337 participants. Um, so this uh, is an example of the traits that we focused on. And so we had five different traits being climate in the location uh, in the area of origin, the distance for migration, the type of migration, the social network at the destination where they would migrate, and the income difference. Um, on the right side, we had uh, up to three different levels for each one of those attributes. And so for climate in the area of origin, we had moderate levels of both slow and sudden onset change, which basically is the status quo. It's what they experience um, on an annual basis. And then we had um, alternate versions, which were was extreme slow onset change, and that included increased salinity and sea level rise, um, as well as erosion and inundation. And then extreme sudden onset change, which was characterized by increasing severity of um, extreme weather like uh, river, or sorry, cyclones, floods, and river erosion. Apologies, I think I put, I think I also mentioned erosion in the slow onset change, but that should be in the extreme onset change. Then we had three different levels of the migration distance, which were uh, near, medium, and far. So up to 50 kil kilometers was considered near, 50 to 300 kilometers was medium. And that's basically the distance between Hatia Island and the major metropolitan area of Dhaka in Bangladesh. And then far was over 300 kilometers. The type of migration was essentially temporary, which was defined as under six months or longer term, considered over six months. And then there were two levels for the social network at, oops, sorry, at the destination, um, including no close relationships with family members or friends or other relatives. And then uh, the second level was that there were close relationships. So you you would know somebody and have a close relationship in the destination where you're going. And finally, for income, there were three levels. One was uh, essentially no different. So income is comparable to the living costs they currently experience versus 20% increase in income um, compared to the cost of living or a 50% increase in income.
Now, this is just an example to show um, what it would look like for a participant. And so they're presented with um, one choice set here. And this provides um, two scenarios. So scenario A and scenario B are both migration choices. And scenario C is an option not to migrate at all. Um, and so what we can see here from scenario A um, versus scenario B is that scenario A is characterized by extreme sudden change um, versus just a moderate level of change. Um, medium term migration or medium distance migration compared to far distance migration, short term versus long term, no close relationships versus close relationships, and then changes in the income. And so a participant would then make a decision um, between whether they prefer scenario A, scenario B, or scenario C not to move at all. And each participant answered um, six different card sets. So they were presented with um, essentially six of these choices. This is what the um, experimental setting looked like. So these were one-to-one -one interviews with people and they went through the choice set first and then they were presented with a survey questionnaire, which also include the human security index and questions around migration. Um, Zung also mentioned the human security index in, in her study and that was created specifically adapted from a, a, a urban human security index to uh, a rural setting, and it was used in both of these studies. Um, the characteristics of the sample were 60% men and 40% women. Uh, the majority were married. Um, the group was mostly between the ages of 30 to 39, although there was quite a range in age, so that only represented 31% of the sample. A uh, majority of the students had, or sorry, of the respondents had no school education. Um, and that was 40% of the population. Then primary was the highest level for 31% of the respondents and secondary school of 20%. The majority of the respondents ranked themselves um, on a scale of one to 10, around two or two and a half um, at 40, 45 and 29% for each of those um, for their per perceived economic status. So basically, um, on a scale of one to five, five being the most wealthy and one being the most poor, um, they would rank them where they felt they they fell in that uh, range. The most popular household size was five to seven people, at uh, fifty two percent of the pop of the sample, and um, only eighteen percent of the respondents had moved uh, outside of Hatia in the past. And um, we consider that, yes, that the migration doesn't include moving um, to a different area of Hatia, but actually moving off the island. Can we move to the results, please? Yes. Um, so what we have here is that we can see in comparison to the stay uh, in in the location and not migrate. Um, so slow onset change and me sudden onset change both have a negative relationship with migration. That means that people were more likely to migrate under moderate change than they were under extreme change, both slow or sudden. Um, people were also more likely to move uh, within 50 kilometers um, compared to the medium or far distances. And uh, the network at the location and the, the type of uh, work was not affecting, that was not significant. Um, the income did have a positive relationship with migration, so the more income they received, the more likelihood they were to, uh, to migrate. Just in terms of um, significance, in uh, in their demographic qualities, uh, age was a significant indicator for migration. So younger people were more likely to gen to migrate. Men were more likely to migrate. Single people, although there weren't very many in the sample, were more likely to migrate. Um, household sizes that had large that had more people in the household had higher rates of migration or higher uh, preference to migrate. And um, the more income that families had, the more likely they were to choose migration. Uh, also, the more likely that someone had migrated in the past uh, 
was indicative that they were more likely to migrate in again in the future. Um, just to give uh, some weight in terms of value on this, um, an income needed to be increased by 14% in order for people to move um, according to, because there was extreme slow onset change and only 9% if there was extreme sudden onset change. Uh, they needed an increase in income of 20% uh, in order to move the medium distance and interesting only 17% to move uh, far distance. And that could be also because people were likely to know, uh, know people or have relatives in the farther distance, uh, which was in, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in the medium distance because that was in DACA. Okay, sorry, just concluding now. Um, so some of the the, Results and findings are that extreme slow onset change and extreme sudden onset change are less likely to induce migration than moderate levels of uh, change. Residents are more likely to migrate with uh, more of an increase in income. Climate drivers do become relevant at a 9% increase in income for extreme change uh, or 14% at slow so onset change. And um, just to follow up, this study will be supported by qualitative research to understand more from um, the participants about what what their choices, why they made those choices, and um, linked to literature on causal drivers of migration. Uh, and then finally, these results can be used to inform um, policy or how to design policy for more vulnerable populations. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie, and also Zung again. Um, I'm sure we have lots of questions and comments. Uh, please raise your hand and then uh, you can ask your question. Feroz. Yeah, uh, good morning and uh, thank you for, thank you both the presenters for nice uh, presentations. Uh, my question is uh, to Dr. Katie. Because uh, I'm from Bangladesh and I can relate a lot with the research and I see the value of it. I have uh, two questions, if I may, if I'm allowed to ask. One is Go like ahead. whether the participants did they uh, like do they realize there is a uh, impact of climate change on their life? And the second would be like when you were taking these um, different variables. Uh, one thing I would like to know whether you have asked them if they had assets on the ground such as like houses land or ponds would they be likely to uh, like migrate or that stops them to take the decision okay yes thank you very much for the questions um yeah the in terms of are they aware of climate change um in yes they experience this all the time um, but because it is something they experience all the time and in cycles, so there are some years that are extreme and some years that are more moderate, um, I don't know that what we didn't see is that they're recognizing um, that the moderate climate change becomes more extreme because it is a slow change. Um, so their environment is changing constantly all the time. Even the shape of the island is, is changing due to um, movement of sedimentation coming from the river. So um, I, I would say they're absolutely aware of um, environmental change, but whether it's being attributed to what we would consider anthropogenic climate change, um, we, we don't have evidence specifically for how they would look at those differences. Um, and in terms of the second one, uh, we do ask about their uh, livelihood and like if they have land and land sizes um, and then what are their main sources um, in income. But uh, either it wasn't significant as part of the reg regression in terms of size of land holding um, or it was combined. Yeah, no, I think it was not um, it was not significant in the regression, which is why it wasn't highlighted. Um, but in terms of doing like a full asset questionnaire, we did not do so we didn't ask about do they have like refrigerator, cell phone, um, how many animals do they have? So uh, we don't have the a full list of assets. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, but the question was whether this having this asset stops them from uh, migrating or taking a decision on migration. So let's say you have a large house and a big uh, like business on uh, farmland or fisheries. Uh, would you like to uh, migrate if uh, climate change actually hits you very hard? That was the question. Uh, and uh, then it raises another question whether you have taken into account different, uh, if, even though you have told us already, like whether there are farmers or there are fishermen, because there are always conflict in the coastal region of Bangladesh among the farmers and the fishermen. So, uh, but like uh, just to highlight, like whether that was taken into account, like the having assets, does it stop them to migrate? That's it. But thank you. Thank you for the answer. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'd have to look if we separate fishers and farmers in terms of um, the regression, but that's very uh, useful information. So thank you, and I will look into that. We have more questions, uh, and I see a hand from Vietnam. Thank you, Nyan. Ah, Dr. Nyan, please. Uh, thanks. Very, very nice uh, information, uh, Kathy and you. I have one question for each of you. Maybe I'm mixing some uh, information. First, for you, um, what, what, uh, what, uh, what, what do you mean, farmers? And um, what do you mean? Rich and or oh, good and very good farmers yeah, in your regions. Uh, for Kathy, um, have you got any information about significant e uh, effects uh, on ages and genders between male and females? Thank you. If at the end, uh, if have more, more time, I will just share information. With you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Nyan. Zoom, you're going to go first. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Nyan, for your question. Um, I So in my in the research, our the participant are, uh, we selected to the subject participant as a, either rice or stream farmers. So they, 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 they cultivating either rice or stream or rice stream. In, um, but also uh, in the setting of the game, we actually assign them a role. So regardless of who they are in the, the reality, we assign them, okay, randomly, whether you uh, follow, like, whether you are very good at stream, very good at rice, or good at rice, or good at stream. So it's a kind of like um, role-playing game. Uh, so it's very random. Uh, and also, um, of course, when we run the regression, we try to control for the actual um actual uh, uh like role that they have uh, but then um it, it was not significant so we we see actually um when we assign the role um we 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 see and also by the setting of the game the very good farmer have like if yeah, they are very good at uh stream and 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 they have four options like whether they they invest in rice or uh, invest invest highly in stream or invest moderately in stream or invest highly in rice or moderately in rice except option have like different uh, outcome and of course if they are very good at stream they their profit will be highest in in the case of they uh, invest highly in stream and th their profit will be lowest when they invest highly in rice uh, and and for the moderate option, it's like in somewhere in between. Um, so we try to create like like inequality situation after that, and also the the role of the bring the role of uh, opportunity cost in this uh, in this game. Um, in we also try to kind of mimic the real situation where 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 farmer have different capacity. Um, like some people can be very potentially very good at, at stream. They if they invest in um, for example, intensive, intensive uh, uh, stream farming, they will 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 uh, successful and earn more. Um, and then then uh, some farmer is it like they 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 are um, like regular farmer. Then they usually if they invest in uh, extensive stream farming, it would be better for them. 
so that that kind of like this is the, a game setting we try to play role uh, but it's also we multi was motivated by the the real situation in in the Mekong Delta Vietnam thank you thanks Zung I hope that answers the question Katie there was also a question for you Yes, if you can just repeat quickly, I didn't catch the question the last, you mentioned um, two things that you asked about and I couldn't hear them, sorry. Uh, yes, um, uh, uh, have you seen any uh, significant effects on ages and gender? On age, yes, sorry. Um, yes, so younger uh, people were more likely to migrate mm -hmm. and males were more likely to migrate. So often in Bangladesh, um, women will migrate, but mostly if their husband is migrating. So single women migrating um, is relatively less likely. Thank, Thank you. you. We have another hand. And I also saw now that you wrote already questions in the chat. Timo Gasbeck. Good morning. Uh, Timo Gasbeck, Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thanks for the interesting presentations. I, I have uh, two questions. Um, I used to work in uh, in Sri Lanka a lot, and and I noticed there that a lot of people actually uh, have one or two family members in the Middle East to send back remittances. Um, those people will be not in your sample because they're physically not in the folder. Um, to what extent has that had an effect on the on the research? Uh, and I'd be interested to see if age has, a, has an impact. Uh, my experience, uh, both in Sri Lanka but also in Darfur, is that often uh, people who are farming or a bit older keep trying to do this as long as they can. Uh, but it's the youth who, uh, who move away. Um, yes, so in terms of the age, um, yes, we did see that that younger people were more likely to migrate. Um, in the survey question, we also asked about family members that have migrated. Um, so that is, we didn't um, use that in the regression about the likelihood of that individual to migrate, but more have that um, as a separate data set um, where we can look at uh, things like remittances and um, because oftentimes we may have asked one family member about their likelihood to migrate. They may not be very willing to migrate, but they have five or six other people in the household that have migrated. And so that's what we were trying to get at, but um, we didn't specifically use it as part of the regression for their choice making. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I see Stefan Weise has another question. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, one short question each. Uh, Zong, uh, my question to you was uh, uh, more about uh, the fact that uh, this behavior change type of study must, in, in the literature you, you uh, reviewed, I assume, uh, ahead of this study, uh, is there any evidence that you found in other countries, in other places where this type of an analysis and conclusions coming out of this analysis actually has changed the policy or incentive mechanisms and led to a reduced uh, conflict potential conflict level or spiteful behavior level of certain groups so that's one question to you so and then to to katie once you have finalized this analysis in terms of validation would it be interesting to uh, go to dhaka or some other area wherever there are uh, you know the migrants are coming pouring into these air, urban areas or peri-urban areas from the south uh, to do a similar type of uh, analysis to see that that information actually is validated that we are getting or you're getting out of the studies being done uh, in uh, in the delta itself thank you thanks stefan zoom do you want to go first again yeah, uh, thank you, Stefan. A very good question. Um, I so in uh, I can say that our research is very much still at the like based on the theory, theoretical uh, framework, and develop from the theory and bring it into the the game setting, uh, which is a bit um, like like uh, in, in still very much in research than than like development or policy oriented. Um, 
but then we um, in 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 the literature uh, I can also see that it's actually that's a uh, like like um, other research for example like people though people doing more in terms of like uh, the behavioral chain or uh, randomized control trial or randomized control experiment or something around um, the 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 experiment related to endorsement of religious uh, uh, leaders. So those those experiment uh, usually um, kind of um, give like a like poli a good policy recommendation and also was taken up by by um, uh, po uh, policy. So I think it's 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 um, will have potentially. Uh, like good implication for for policy uh, uh, later for policy implementation. Um, I and, and I'm sure that there's a research uh, out there uh, into research also research um, successful to bring it uh, into uh, more um, like policy application. Uh, but I must say again that my research is still very the theoretical. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can also maybe follow on with that. Um, what has been done quite often more in development work is um, they'll take the sort of theoretical common pool resource and public goods games and use them as part of the community learning. So have the the groups play that actually have to make these kinds of decisions play the games and then reveal the outputs to them and show that when the majority decision is chosen and some people lose out, that spiteful behavior can be a result of that and then ask them how they would manage that. So I've seen that happen with, particularly with irrigation and water systems in India and other countries where they're more using it more as a co-creation in terms of like um, the, the actual rules and regulations and social norms that the community themselves would come up with. Um, and I think that that is most likely um, the way that this should be used as opposed to making high level um, policy necessarily like at the national level because the circumstances and context is quite different across even in the same country. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the question that you had for Bangladesh about validation, um, we didn't consider going to DACA to validate the study because we would have to find, like, I think the sampling would be really difficult. We'd have to find residents from Hatia, um, or we would have to assume, at least find residents that come from areas that do have extreme climate change. Um, in the past, or in some literature uh, that I'm familiar with, the way that they did this type of study was um, go to families who have migrants and then request can they communicate with the migrants. So that would be something we may consider is actually using our sample size from Hatia and then asking them can we contact through the telephone, um, you know, the people who have left and then either ask them like a series of simple survey questions that can be done over the phone or a very simple type of um, game that we that would be very easy to understand over the phone, like option A and option B. But it has to be very, very simplified because, um, you know, they can't see what you're talking about. There's no visual representation, so it has to be very clear in terms of what the choices are. And generally, you'd also have to have some way to electronically um, send the money to them because these games are based on real real choices that have economic consequences. For the most part, the choice experiment, although was not um, the the everybody had a similar participant fee, there was no change. Whereas the game that Zoom played, some people earned more and other people earned less based on their decisions. Yeah. Thanks for the detailed explanation, Katie. I saw in the chat that Mariana had. Uh, a few questions. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah. I thought you? that um, I, I put a question on um, how did you both explain what the added values are for participants, so to really, um, yeah, take part in the studies. And I, I asked both, but I, I now will only ask it to Sung as our time is short. So that is maybe a concluding question. So how do we convince people to do that, and what is in for them? So why why should they take part in it? So that's. 
Zoom. What? How did you do that? With you had a very huge sample. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, actually, we uh, did that. Like um, the like we recruit the farmer through like uh, of course with the support uh, a lot of support from the local governments. Um, and then uh, when they they participated in the the game session and. And uh, they also we also pay a bit of comp uh, com compensation, but the added value here I I think like like through participating the game we also exp um, explain that um, like okay you are doing some task and later we we'll, uh, uh, we try to kind of um, create uh, some some task for you to do we try to avoid to saying it's a game so to to create a very serious uh, um, ser serious uh, task that they can do think and decide and later we also kind of communicate like okay this is um uh, we try to make everything random to make sure that it will later not to create any con post conflict because Definitely different people have different uh, like payoff. Uh, so it's also um, but then um, we later we also kind of like communicate with the people like, OK, you can see that if if you cooperate more, you can see both will have more money like uh, in the reality. It also the same if you contribute more to to to, uh, to the, the the public good, for example, or community uh, or do more community work, then is everyone will be beneficial. Or uh, if you did like have destructive behavior, you lose other also lose. It's kind of like like like, like um, behavioral. Um, uh, uh lesson kind of afterwards um and uh yeah so 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 actually people really enjoy the the game because um people are with doing more um structural survey for example and it takes like for example like 30 minutes um uh and then uh, 30 minutes for what one hour but then they was like not really like not very uh, interactive and also, um, is 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 uh, for them they that ask and answer, uh, enumerator ask and they answer. But here they actually make some decision, and they kind of have some consequences after that decision, which is make them like more more kind of like um, engaged in the 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 the, the game. And um, yeah, and I can see that uh, usually the 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 admin for, uh, the the. The uh, atmosphere after the um, the game session was quite quite nice, and people are actually happy to answer our survey more <laughs> than usual. Yeah, like mm -hmm. after the game. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Zung, for for sharing those those insights. And indeed, we have to stop it here, as Mariana pointed out. We are uh, done with our hour today. We'll have one more. Uh, Delta talks in December, the next one, the 20th of December. And as we're alternating with speakers from uh, AMD and Wageningen, next time uh, someone from uh, Wageningen will speak. Mariana, do you know already? And do you yes. want to give a, a short sneak preview? Yes, so the, the tentative title of the talk uh, is uh, Quinoa as a new crop for the Mekong Delta in salinity affected areas, mm -hmm. opportunities and steps to take. So that is uh, what uh, mm -hmm. we will get uh, on the 20th of December. And that is a cooperation between a colleague here from Wageningen and a colleague from Travin University. Sounds very interesting. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, and thanks everybody for joining today. I hope uh, to see all of you back in four weeks. Till then, have a good time. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. bye.